Welcome to Commune, a global wellness community and online course platform featuring some of the world's greatest teachers. We are on a mission to inspire, heal, pass down wisdom, and bring the world closer together. This is the Commune Podcast, where each week we explore the ideas and practices that help us live this healthy, connected, and purpose-filled life. Okay, a brief moment at the front here to announce a slightly different approach to the podcast. So first off, I want to express my profound appreciation to everyone who has supported this podcast, our diligent commune team, all of the brilliant teachers and authors who have been on the show, the mission-driven brands who have provided financial support, and most of all, you, all of the listeners who have helped turn this modest endeavor into a powerful platform for ideas. So in my writings and various exhortations, I have been a vociferous critic of the ad revenue model, which has misaligned incentives in journalism. And while Commune's brand partners have always been in alignment with our message of well-being and sustainability, I want to try to produce this show without any advertisement. Quite simply, I think it's a better experience without ads. This doesn't change the reality that there are hard costs associated with the production of the show. And moreover, there is significant time expenditure. Now, I am committed to helping to build a world where well-being can flourish, and I have to allocate my time accordingly in the pursuit of this mission. So I never want anyone's financial wherewithal to stand between them and the ability to glean wisdom from the guests on this show. So this podcast will remain free to anyone who is interested in listening to it. That being said, if you have the financial ability to support our efforts, I would be grateful if you headed over to onecommune.com slash support, onecommune.com slash support. You can contribute a few bucks or join Commune membership and get unlimited access to all of our courses. Thank you. And it's an honor to do this work. Okay, on to the show. Today, I am speaking with Ash Amberger. Ash is the founder of The Middle Finger Project, author of the book, The Middle Finger Project, and the proprietor of Two Middle Fingers, which she wields regularly in her insightful, if irreverent, articles on politics and culture. Ash grew up in a trailer in New Milford, Pennsylvania, which she colorfully describes as Trumplandia. Here is a brief excerpt from one of her articles where she describes this part of rural America. There's a pump and pantry convenience store. Eight miles up the road, there's a Smoke and Joe cigarette outlet. There are numerous firework warehouses, bars that have pencil-scrawled names of the people who are banned that month, and an empty parking lot or the old roller skating rink burned down. While Ash left her hometown and became a published author, she still holds affection for her hometown and its community. So with one foot in rural America and one foot in urban coastal culture, Ash has become a translator of sorts between these two polarized worlds. So on the show, we talk about how differently these two cultures see the world and why and if there's any hope of us ever coming back together. I hope you enjoy this week's episode with Ash Amberger. My name is Jeff Krasno, and welcome to Commune. Uh, I suppose that one of the reasons why we're talking today is that I, I was passed an article that you had written, which I thought was brilliant and led me down a rabbit hole of your writings in general, which I appreciate deeply. And they're the resonant specifically in this time, um, given that you grew up in rural Pennsylvania, New Milford, I believe, Pennsylvania. Um, and... Uh, and you have insight into rural America, which I believe confounds coastal liberal 
America. Uh, and obviously the, there's a great chasm between the two, as we see expressed in our political invective. But you seem to be a translator, almost from English to English, um, between the language of rural America and um and coastal elite America, if you will. So could you take a, maybe a few minutes, and I, I've read some just absolutely brilliant visual writing that, um, that you've done on this, but can you describe a little bit of your hometown and Susquehanna County in Pennsylvania and just give us a bit of a feeling for that? Certainly, yes. That's, that's accurate. New Milford, Pennsylvania, located in the county of Susquehanna, uh, is what you would categorize as, uh, you know, modern day Trumplandia. I'm going to say, um, we, you know, growing up there, it's a very tight knit community. And one of the things that I've been really grappling with is trying to understand what has caused now, this divide is such a deep divide that's happening right now. So I've been doing a lot of research and, and contemplating what what it was like growing up there and how some of these messages could be appealing to this group of people. So to answer your question, we have got a place where essentially when you grow up there, you stay there. Leaving was something that was foreign, and it was something that I did that was it kind of I was kind of looked at like a question mark. Like, well, what are you, what are you going to do? Why are you leaving us? And there's a sense of abandonment that happens. But we're talking very small communities that were booming back in the coal ages, and have since been on this steady decline, steady, steady decline that has never gotten better. Uh, most of the population is blue collar, uh, you know, working class, kind of salt of the earth kind of people. They take a lot of pride in that. And honestly, on a whole, uh, they're really, they're really good to one another. And I think they really do come together as a community, which is why I think it's also very easy to look at other people as outsiders and say that, well, you know, we're experiencing this and this, what we're experiencing is not what we, what you're experiencing. So I think it's easy to create a narrative that has, as you've said, like the, the coastal liberal elite as the enemy and anyone who's coming from these rural towns as the victim. I think there is a huge victim mindset and I think that's perpetuated by a lack of opportunity in general that is felt very deeply. Uh, you know, just to go to the mall, you've got to drive 45 minutes to get anything. So if that's, you know, just what you have to do to get to a store, like a grocery store, then of course, it, it, you know, that has a ripple effect with what kinds of opportunities you can have professionally. And I, I truly, to paint the picture, when I grew up there, it was the kind of place where, yes, you know, we did door-to-door -door fundraisers for the Washington, D.C. field trip, and everything was very honky-dory, and we all went down to the local swimming pool, and we had our ham sandwiches, and, and uh, we were safe. It was very picturesque in that kind of like 1950s kind of way. And every time I've gone back to visit, that picture has changed dramatically. Yeah. I was revisiting um, the Andy Griffith show in my mind uh, as you were talking, and I've been thinking about that recently, this kind of town of Mayberry that we romanticize in our heads. We almost see it in black and white where, you know, the sheriff is good natured and nobody ever really goes to jail, you know, um, <laughs> and, uh, and I suppose just to kind of put it in a prescient context, here we are three weeks or so from an important election. Some categorize it as existential. And while the polls certainly show the challenger, Joe Biden, who actually uh, hails from Scranton, um, 
shows that he's significantly ahead in the polls. But of course, we've been here before. In fact, this morning when I went to Real Clear Politics, it uh, it um, articulated that Hillary Clinton actually held a bigger lead in the polls of the battleground states on this day four years ago than Joe Biden does now. And of course, given the nature of our electoral system with its college, um, the outcome may very well be decided in hometowns like yours across the Midwest, as it was four years ago, rural voters in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio, who decidedly broke for Mr. Trump. Um, So, you know, and many liberals, I suppose, are just kind of pulling their hair out right now, just perplexed how anyone, particularly Christians, can support the president, given his rather crude and moral rudderlessness. Um, And you wrote one particular article that just I I thought was so helpful um, and clear on this. And it was called Why Donald Trump Crude Messaging Lands with Rural Voters Despite Their Notorious Christian Values. And as I was, I think, intimating before, this article serves almost a trans- as a translation from two different kinds of English. Um, and I'd love to get into that because it gets specific about particular language. And I think you decode this language so well. And it starts with a photo of a truck, of a semi that is traveling through Pennsylvania or maybe through the United States. And I wonder if you could just sort of tell us about that truck, paint that picture, and maybe we can uh, get into some of the language that you help translate for us. Sure. Yeah. The, tr- the truck that you're referencing is part of a series. There is a man actually based out of Scranton, Pennsylvania, who has several uh, tractor trailers that he's decorated, for <laughs> lack of a better word, with uh, messaging for Donald Trump for president. And some of it would, I think, would be classified as as quite ignorant in many people's books. But we've got language that states things like close the borders, keep Mexican dope down in Mexico, uh, you know, lock her up, build the wall, freedom isn't free, uh, you know, respect the flag. And to them... This type of language, you know, deplorable Americans, this is, a, this is a sense of pride for this community in particular. So that's, that's what's happening right now. Um, I will say that there is this sort of sense of lawlessness that I think goes hand in hand with the appreciation of Donald Trump. Um, you mentioned a minute ago, it's the kind of place where, you know, the, there's one town sheriff and nobody really goes to jail. I have to say, there's actually no police. Um, I took a screenshot yesterday of someone's Facebook post that really, you know, to give you some indication of where the mindset is, the, the post said, if one more person asks if we can do Halloween in town, I'm going to lose my mind. We do not have cops. Who is going to stop you? Do drug dealers ask if they can deal drugs every day? No one stops them and we all watch them do it every single day. So turn your, turn your lights on and hand out the damn candy coronavirus be damned. <laughs> so, <clears throat> right. So like, this is where it's at. They, 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 they look at themselves as rebels and they see tractor trailers like this as being rebellious to the establishment. And that's where we're at. You know, we see some of these messages and I can understand from growing up there why it resonates with them. You know, we've got a lot of discussion around the flag and the current situation around kneeling to them, you know, they're sitting there looking at this going, we're the ones who sent our sons and daughters to battle innocent kids. You know, we all know someone who died in Iraq and Afghanistan and this American flag represents their memory. So by you kneeling, you're disrespecting me and my family. How dare you? You must be the radical left. That's one example. Hmm. So yeah, just let's hover there just for one minute, because uh, I think this is a potent example. And so uh, on one side, you're saying 
that these are the families that lost children or children made the ultimate sacrifice to go serve their country and to fight for freedom. And that now we have kind of in the wake of Colin Kaepernick kneeling, we have this efflorescence of disrespect for the flag and for the sacrifices that many of these people and families have made. So there seems to be a chasm between the idea of a disrespecting the flag and peaceful protesting that is wanting to engage in a more open conversation about race. Yes. Is that a, and but does that message resonate at all? Like is the idea that that my son and daughter and cousin and aunt and uncle fought for the freedoms that now protect your ability to peacefully protest? Or is that combination of ideas just kind of too difficult? It seems to be lost. It seems to be lost. I did speak recently with a military veteran who also grew up in town, but who has since left town, and he is a liberal. And so we had a discussion where he said, you know, I don't think they understand that the thing that kept me going was the knowledge that what I was fighting for and and putting my life on the line for was the ability to protest and to be able to kneel and protest. And, and that seems to be lost in translation. The community as a whole sees the flag as being a black and white issue. If you are doing anything to disrespect the flag, you are disrespecting troops, and it doesn't matter what your argument is for doing that. Right. And I suppose, can you just give us sort of a demographic snapshot into your hometown and, and hometowns like it? Yep. It is 98.54% white. Uh, I don't think that anyone I grew up with had any friends that were for example, Mexican, which uh, you know speaks a lot to the narrative around keep Mexican dope in Mexico. Uh, we had one black friend at one point who had come from Philadelphia and he was in the foster system. And that was the only type of racial diversity that any of us saw. Um, I, can, I can testify here that I know several friends who have parents who flat out refuse to leave the county on matters of principle certainly do not travel to places like New York City. Uh, and it, it, it truly is a different, it's a different world. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about that notion of foreign, or very specifically what I remember being written on the side of that truck, keep Mexican dope in Mexico. Can you decipher that particular quotation for us? Absolutely. Uh, the, the opioid ac epidemic has struck places like this in significant ways. And so people that they grew up with, their own kids, not only went to war and fought and died, many of them, but now when they came back home, now they're still dying. They're dying because of opioids and they're dying uh, because because of some marketing initiatives that were taken on by big pharmaceutical companies specifically to target rural white America. When they first came out with Oxycontin, the idea was, hey, this is actually safe for you because it's long, it, it releases over a period of 12 hours. But they didn't want to test it in the cities where people can be, uh, you know, vulnerable to addiction. And so instead, they they explicitly went to rural white America to test out drugs like these. And you know, some casual drug users quickly realized that you could crush this stuff up and you could get high off of it. And in a place where there's so much despair and people drink a 12-pack of beer before they go out to the bar, 
this was like a, a you know a, a new fun option to relieve yourself of some of this despair and so people quickly became addicted to oxycotton which didn't seem like that quote big of a deal and then the drug makers got smart and there were some fe- federal regulations put into place and those pills were made more difficult to crush which meant that uh users who were now addicted had to turn to something that was more easily available and cheaper and that became heroin and then you know heroin dealers in an effort to make more profit started cutting that with fentanyl and so now we've got a very big crisis uh, a lot of which is also the result of fracking and the gas industry moving into communities like mine they were traditionally you know in places like Kentucky and I and that's where this drug issue originated but then when fracking started and those gas companies started moving into places like Pennsylvania with that came this new addiction so when we hear things like keep Mexican dope in Mexico i think it is based on a lot of misunderstanding about why the opioid crisis exists and when you have someone like Donald Trump openly blaming Mexico and stating out loud, you know, our southern border is a pipeline <laughs> for meth, heroin, cocaine, fentanyl. You know, what do you think they're going to believe? These are not people who are doing their own independent research or journalism. They hear the president and they think to themselves, why do I have any reason to doubt him? Yeah. And I suppose some of the rhetoric coming from the president <clears throat> about foreigners beyond the specific issue of drugs, but more related to crime in general, only sort of exacerbates that feeling. And certainly we've all seen the clip ad nauseum with the president talking about, you know, Mexico not sending their best and sending, you know, criminals and rapists across across the border. And so this ties into one of the I think one of the most prominent slogans of 2016, which to be honest has kind of disappeared from the dialogue this time around, but build that wall. Um which r- seemed to resonate deeply in in the rural midwest so maybe dissect that one yeah oh gosh you know i've got my own theories about it but a lot of that xenophobia i think is is a function of an unconscious fear that people who don't speak my language and who have skin that's different than me are going to come in and they're going to change what i know to be true and what i know to be true is the only thing i got going for me it's all I've got. I've got I've got my belonging in my community and I know what's what here. So I don't want someone to come in here and change who we are and what I know. I think this is an identity crisis more than anything. And unfortunately that's being manifested in really hateful <laughs> racist language that is an attempt to defend uh their good name and and who they are as people. And I also think that this, this, you know, this is my own personal thought, but I do see in relation to the war and relation to ISIS, I understand that there was that narrative around hating foreigners. And we had September 11 and, and this idea of quote, the Muslim community being bad. And then you see other folks who have dark skin and speak a different language. And I think there's being a false association. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, certainly when you target people that have a tremendous amount of despair in their lives and you instill that despair with a deep sense of fear around a problem and then ratchet that fear up consistently day after day and then present a reason or scapegoat for that fear, um, you know, you can rule the world. And, and I, I believe that's, that has been what, what we've seen. And, you know, 
I suppose it's like, you know, I don't want this podcast ever to be sort of an indictment um, of, of conservative America, because that's actually undoes the entire point. I mean, you know, when we look at the ground conditions for why this chasm exists, you know, I think that, you know, the Democratic Party or liberals need to look in the mirror uh, quite a bit because, you know, they're the rural America or blue collar America had for generations been a sturdy part of the Democratic Party. But it feels like the Democratic Party abandoned the interests of blue collar and, and rural America. Um, or, you know, a lot of these towns wouldn't have gotten boarded up. So, you know, in, in many ways, you know, the, the, there's this kind of, I guess, arrogance versus ignorance dialectic that, that, that seems kind of in stark relief. But when you That's dig a great kind of, way to put it. Oh. Yeah. But when you sort of dig under that, you know, I, I think we all share some culpability for the kind of tribalism, you know, that we're seeing right now. Um, anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Can I comment on that quickly? Please. Yeah. I think that relates so much to the, the dialogue we're seeing around All Lives Matter. And from what I read on that, it, it my read is just simply that there's this sense that, yes, rural America has been left behind. They feel forgotten. It's not like they don't know. They feel very much forgotten. And I think it's kind of like, hey, man, you know, I've been waiting patiently my entire life for someone to give a damn about me and my plight. And guess what? Nobody ever does. We are ignored. I've been on my I've been on my own my whole life, but you don't see me complaining. You know, I've kind of worked hard and I've figured it out every single day. So I'd say the same thing to anyone else who wants to try to skip the line and get some kind of special treatment just because, for example, you are black. It's it, the attitude is like take a number, buddy. Work hard the way the rest of us have. And I I, I I struggle with this so much, yeah. but I, I think that's how they're viewing the Black Lives Matter movement as something that's trying to skip ahead of the line. Right. Like, what about my life? I'm struggling, too. And it's not only your plight that needs to be amplified my plight needs to be amplified too, hence all lives. And yeah, I think the, the disconnect here is clearly that the slogan or the movement for Black Lives or Black Lives Matter is about specifically calling out the plight of a racial group in the United States that has suffered from great inequity and still does. Um, but I suppose that rural America is suffering from many of the same things, you know, a wealth gap, an income gap, an education gap, um, a, a incarceration to some degree, certainly drug abuse. Um, and, um, and it is, uh, yeah, it is a very... <laughs> It is it very you, difficult. Yeah. Yeah. It makes you up in arms. But I will say this also points to a, another significant difference. And I think that this is really highlighting the lack of agency that rural America has uh, as a population, but also an internalized sense of agency. They've lost that. We have the Black Lives Matter movement because people decided enough was enough and we're going to do something about it. And this is our recourse. This is what we're going to do. We're going to make some noise. Whereas rural America, I think, is really lacking this fundamental sense of ownership over their ability to change things. And I think that a lot of that comes from the sense of helplessness that you feel when you're in isolation. You don't see a lot of people being successful. 
This is what you know. And you do end up with this sensation that other people are responsible for your happiness. So when someone like Donald Trump comes in and says, you know what? It's not you guys. I'm going to help you guys. It's these Democrats over here. They really want to believe him. Mm, yeah, that's a that's a insightful point. I mean, I suppose you could say that Donald Trump has given this community agency. Sadly. And I think it's the wrong kind of agency. I think that's what we've been fighting against on on the liberal side of things is that looking at folks who are still voting for Donald Trump again in 2020 and going, how can you do that? But not understanding that this to them is their way of of protesting in yeah. many ways. And, and I suppose some of the twisted thing right now is that agency uh, trumps, uh, no pun intended, almost <laughs> anything, almost anything that essentially <laughs> both sides of the political spectrum are in some ways willing to vote against their own self-interest in the name of agency. <laughs> You know, that you that if you are in New Milford, Pennsylvania, you will likely vote for Donald Trump, despite the fact that he is working hard to take away your health insurance. But the fact that he has propelled you and your sense of purpose and your recognition and the recognition that you exist and that you are important, that psychological component is actually more powerful than any policy or or any end result from the policies of Donald Trump and the Republican Party at this juncture. Yes, uh, I, I think we've got we've got a lot of unlogic happening here, and I yeah. think it's it's a product of, gosh, man, I, I hate to say it, but Fox News is the channel. It's what's on the lower cable channels. It's just there. It's what people watch. I interned at a Fox News affiliate station in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania in college. It's just there, number one. And then number two, Facebook has become the dominant source of people's information. It's where they hang out and spend their time and try to get outside of this community. So we all know what's happening with social media and the algorithms. And then you combine that with a fear of other people and a lack of opportunity and no travel. It's this bubble. And what is truth in the end? You know, truth is what you see. It's what you see around you. And in terms of not understanding the greater world and what's at stake here, I do think that there's a lot of unlogic and misinformation. Uh, I, I don't understand the voting against yourself piece but I quote someone leaving a comment from my hometown the other day in, in response to something I posted said, no, thanks. I'm not in the mood for taxes to be raised, to become a communist country, to see a pedophile in office, a man who has voted for racist laws in his last 47 years, a, a VP who prides herself on locking up people for cheap labor, and to see our economy tank when he forces another closure and makes masks mandatory and wants to take guns from law-abiding citizens and leave us all defenseless. No thanks, Biden. Trump, pro-Second Amendment, pro-life, and pro-economy. Yeah, that sums it up. Right, but it's, it's interesting that that is the perspective and it's just, it's the narrative that's being fed to these communities and and they're they're putting it on repeat they're repeating it yeah yeah i suppose that litany of of indictments against biden rolls up um into the great slogan of them all which is make america great again um you know which is like you just said you know it's Pro Second Amendment. It's pro business. It's you know, yes. Without being delicate, pro white, um, and uh, it is this kind of you know. I mean, just the the language in and of itself 
makes one look backwards and imagine in their head a time when America was great. And to me, that resonate that what that feels like is this kind of 1950s uh, fantasy, um, this kind of post-war military industrial complex fantasy when there was tremendous amount of wealth accumulated in the United States and um, and certainly you know suburban and rural economies you know were thriving. But of course, this was you know pre civil rights movement, you know, um, pre environmental catastrophe, pre tech, um, etc. So it's um, you know I, you know despite anyone's best intentions, I, I don't feel that it's possible to go back to that version of our society. Yeah. And I would also argue that a lot of the folks who are carrying on this rhetoric are too young to remember that time. And I actually think that their vision of what it means to make America great again is actually when America didn't have to face hard questions and hard problems when no one was talking about any of this stuff and they could just hide it and and just ignore it. I think that's really what it comes down to is like life was way better when when none of this stuff happened and we didn't have to have hard conversations. And I think that goes back to a lack of agency, a lack of of critical thought and you know, where does that go from? You know, education is a problem. Education is a huge problem. We need to encourage our people to learn how to think critically. Um there's a lot of bitterness that exists. And even when, I mean, to your point about how can someone argue for stuff that benefits, argue against stuff that benefits them? And I had a conversation with a young woman who, in response to my discussion of like, hey, but wouldn't it be great if the minimum, <laughs> the minimum wage was $15 an hour? And her response to me in, in this bitter fashion was, yeah, well, I want to know how a Burger King worker deserves $15 an hour when I busted my butt to go get a degree from community college and I barely make over 10. So you see, there's this very big contrast between, even though that would benefit everyone as a whole, it's very much self-centered and and like, well, I didn't have that benefit. So I don't want other people to, too, because it's not fair. Right. Yeah. And then I I suppose... On the left, and I'll use myself as an example in this particular regard, that I'm actually willing to, quote unquote, vote against my own best interest and pay higher taxes, though I don't I don't meet the criteria of Biden's four hundred thousand dollars a year, sadly. But um, right. But still, for me, I have a different understanding of patriotism uh, and and. For me, patriotism is my is an abil- is sort of a willingness to uh, to share. And I mean, for me, I see my plight, my self interest, and the collective good as one in the same thing. That kind of our liberation is bound. That I, you know, I can't be free until everyone is free. That if you know, my daughter does not have a proper if my daughter has a proper education and someone else's doesn't, well, that that's that's does not a good society make. Um, but these are very, um, but that idea of kind of the collective good um, seems to get kind of lumped in to socialism or communism or Marxism, um, certainly on Facebook, and and there doesn't seem to be any room for for thoughtful discussion around it yeah and the surprising thing that i've always noticed is that for as much as i started off this conversation talking about the small town community and how people do feel very loyal to that community uh, i will say that there's also this other renegade sense of independence where we've got people who live out in the sticks they live miles and miles from their neighbors 
Um, sometimes, you know, the buses don't even go out there to get their kids for school. They just cancel school instead because it's too icy for the buses to get in the, the back roads, the dirt roads. And so there is this rugged sense of individualism where people go out, they hunt their own deer, they butcher the deer, they eat the deer, they keep it in the freezer. It's kind of weird if you don't have a freezer full of dead deer. Um, <laughs> everyone had, yeah. and unless you live in a trailer like I did, <laughs> everyone had the first day of hunting season off, it, like as a rule. <laughs> uh, and, and people, including little girls, go hunting with their fathers and their mothers, actually. And, and, and they're very independent in a different way. But something that's always struck me is this conversation about the guns. Now, I get why having a gun in that kind of environment is useful if that's your thing. If you're a deer hunter, for example, that's what you do. Um, but I also can't help but notice this fear this fear that is embedded with everyone there who needs to carry a gun. I have an old high school classmate who is a, uh, a state trooper. So naturally he's got a gun, but he's also got an arsenal of guns. And his wife, who is this dainty little beautiful thing, she carries a small gun like in her, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know what you call it in, in like a little holster <laughs> underneath her clothes and uh, when we talked about this at one point several years ago when Trump was getting elected, I, I said, well, what, you know, what's the deal? Because I feel like in the city, you'd have more fear over maybe a dangerous encounter or something going wrong. But out here, like you guys don't even lock your doors ever. No one locks their doors at night. They don't lock their car when they go into the, you know, into the restaurant. But yet, you are so worried that someone's going to break into your house in the middle of the night. And I don't understand it to this day. I can't actually translate that. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I felt the same um, phenomena in the wake of 9-11. So I, were, I lived in New York um, when September 11th happened in, in 2001. And in the aftermath of that tragedy, you know, New Yorkers really came together around this kind of collective grief and, you know, there was this kind of period that I'll always remember as being kind of beautiful um, in the aftermath of, you know, real community, like people giving each other hugs on the subway and high-fiving on the sidewalk, you know, people of all creeds and, and races and religions and backgrounds. Um, and, it, and I will say that while certainly it, it, it shook us, there wasn't a tremendous amount of fear um, in comparison to the fear that was being felt in other parts of the country that had no threat of terrorist action against them. Like there was, I, I remember really feeling kind of shaken by that of like here we were in new york kind of the epicenter of, of anything that would happen from an attack perspective and you know there just wasn't really the the kind of um xenophobia or or kind of defcon 5 levels of of anxiety and fear that there was in kind of rural virginia and yeah you know i, I don't understand i don't fully understand that that phenomenon other than you know to kind of understand how you described it before this kind of sense of otherness where you just don't know anyone who is a muslim or who is a mexican so it is easy to cubby them cubby hole them in a particular way that involves a tremendous amount of fear yeah. Yep. And I will say, I don't, th I don't think most people do it on purpose. I think there's this generalized fear of outsiders. I wouldn't call it a dislike. I mean, I don't know that there's actually been opportunity in person to have dislike because there's really not a lot of, of diversity in those areas. But from what I've experienced, you know, people in general are just not fans of outsiders. And I think that that's why the moment someone like Joe Biden, who is from Scranton, becomes what one would classify as a politician. He now has a new rank in society. 
And he's now someone fancy from Washington, D.C. And he now is no longer one of the group. So I think when you see someone like Donald Trump, who obviously we know is not one of the group at all, but who can market himself as such, it is it is it's a simple matter of putting on the right lipstick. That's what marketing does for companies and brands. And make no mistake, that's exactly what you know what Donald Trump is. He's a brand. And it's a brand that they've bought into because I think it reinforces who they are as people, gives them their sense of pride back, and makes it okay to be a country. I was, oh God, I was going to say bumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. but, you know, I can, I can say it because yeah. I'm from there. You know, it, it makes it yeah. okay again. You don't have this pressure to, to do all the things, the smart things that all the smart kids do. You can just be you and it's totally fine. And there's some right. appeal in that. Yeah. I, yeah. I want to go back to that point about um, what you said, that there is not really a dislike around the other. Um there's just maybe like um, an unfamiliarity with it, and this is this is a bit of an indictment of the of the left, or what, what you know some people might call like the woke left. Um, and it is, uh, I guess, the banner for this is the basket of deplorables or deplorable Americans that that of course was was part of Hillary's um, downfall, and. I think that from everything that I read, um, where, you know, the New York Times will send, you know, a reporter out to Susquehanna County, Pennsylvania, and, you know, they'll ask a, an earnest question of like, um, well, you know, if you're Christian, how do you square your Christian values with a leader who arguably cannot recite a single verse of scripture? And not only that, but engages in you know sexual abusive behavior, et cetera, we just go on with a litany of things. And what I most often read is that folks that have maintained a fealty to Trump do so because they do not like being called racist. They do not like being called ignorant. And, you know, kind of post-civil rights movement, um, for very good reason, the worst thing that you could call someone was a racist. Um, and in the 70s and 80s, that word just rooted in as kind of like the most evil thing that you could be. And, it, and that's good. That's good for society. That's good for the kind of vision of equity that almost all of us share. Um, but be, but when that word became so toxic, it became a weapon. And there is a tendency on the left to expand the definition of racism kind of almost all the time. Because, and a lot of it is rooted in good intention. Like, we want to eradicate it. But because we keep expanding the definition of that word to include almost anyone who is not engaged every single day in tearing down the systems and structures that perpetuate inequity, people feel attacked. They feel like they're being cubbyholed as this awful toxic thing and um and you know i i felt that that really took root in that comment you know th that that hillary made around basket of, of deplorables and you know again i would kind of really question the left and our use of vocabulary in, in this regard that it might not be the best strategy to continue to point at people from Susquehanna County and other counties like it and deem them racist. Oh, yeah. I, I, you know, there is an interesting 
There's an interesting notion of decorum. For all of its lack of decorum as a place in general, like I just cited drinking a 12-pack before showing up <laughs> to have dinner with your family or whatever, um, yeah. there is also a sense of decorum where I think people in general uh, are are polite and it, part of this is an intimidation factor. If you don't know how to talk about something and you don't understand the complexities of it, then it becomes much easier to say, you know what? No, screw that. This is all a bunch of, you know, political nonsense. Uh, they're very anti being PC because it feels too fragile. But I will say, I mean, I, I can remember from personal experience when I first studied abroad, when I was in college, and I came back. I actually came to Costa Rica for my very first experience. And I have, of course, I'd fallen in love. I was 19 <laughs> years old. I, of course, I came back just all ooing and eyeing about this, you know, this Latin lover, if you will. And I distinctly remember my, my best friend in the world. I was at her home and they were from a, a quote, good family. And her mother said to me, you know, that's great that you had such a nice time. And I'm glad you, you fell in love. Just remember, though, you're not going to bring him home and marry him. And it was very matter of fact, hmm. but it wasn't out of disgust necessarily. It wasn't an angry rant. It was just very factual. Later, I went on and, and I brought a <laughs> – actually, I brought a Mexican guy to her daughter's wedding. <laughs> and you know there's no uh there's no it, it's very polite no one is saying anything racist no one is actually acting racist but there is this subtle question in the back of everyone's minds is she really gonna is she really gonna be with that guy and i think it goes back to it goes back to this fear of outsiders they don't trust anyone who's not from there when i first left town and I had, you know, a certain set of accomplishments under my belt. I came back to town to visit a couple times thinking I was going to be welcomed like like a football player goes back to their hometown and there's like, you know, oh, yeah. people are excited. <laughs> I got yeah. a book deal. I'm like writing stuff. I'm doing good, whatever. And instead, I was met with a lot of whispers. You know, who does she think she is? Kind of a conversation. So in many ways, there's just a closed-minded, closed everything kind of area and yeah. ah, Donald Trump ticks off the boxes. Yeah. Let's go back to guns for a minute. Um, because I think the last statistics I read there, there are more guns than people in the United States. Um, I think somewhere around 400 million guns, which just as a visual seems completely insane. <laughs> um, but, you know, given the plot that was just uncovered by the FBI to kidnap and, I suppose, potentially assassinate Governor Whitmer of, of Michigan, um, this was a militia group and um, obviously kind of the vigilante, vigilante justice kind of pursued by folks like Kyle Rittenhouse. Um, does it concern you? given that we're careening towards an election um, and it, that has been heralded by the president as a fraud or potentially a hoax, kind of, you know, riddled with kind of mismanagement of, of mail-in ballots, et cetera. Does it worry you? Are you legitimately concerned that we may see that kind of libertarian ethos kind of flex its muscle in the wake of the election through militias, armed militias, um, in places like Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin, et cetera. I think there's a good reason why you could make the argument that this could be a concern for obvious reasons. But I don't actually think it will come to fruition. The reason for that is because a lot of these folks are family-oriented people. 
They want to be home with their families. I don't think, you know, just like we talked about the sense of agency, I don't think that this would be something that ultimately grows into a civil war requiring folks to leave their families and go fight for this thing that they believe in because that's not the pattern. I think that it's easy to talk about it on Facebook and it's easy to, you know, be a pro-Trump supporter, but I don't think it's going to come to that. But I do think the greater concern is viewing the government as the enemy. And that's exactly what the problem is. When you think about history in America, it made sense when we made the Second Amendment because we were fighting for our independence from Britain and they were trying to wage war and we needed to defend ourselves because we didn't have a military to begin with. It was every man on his own that made sense. And that's where you know, some of these conversations are happening. It's reminiscent of like, hey, well, if they're gonna if they're gonna come for us, we got to be ready. But now it's their own government, and th- there's this this really dangerous sense of mistrust. No one trusts the government. They don't trust a single word of it, and that's where the problem is. So, how do we fix that relationship? Yes, and, and this is kind of you know where I'd like to go in in the remaining time that we have is that you know I think you've done a, an extremely articulate job kind of articulating the chasm that exists between, you know, urban liberal America and rural conservative America. And, you know, I would say part of that division is the degree to which each group actually believes in the in, in traditional conventional institutions that have historically provided stability for our country, um, you know, often at the expense of complete equity and justice, but stability nonetheless. And those three institutions are media or journalism, science and medicine, and government. And, you know, obviously, it's not just the president, but the president has done his fair share at undermining the credibility of the media, sometimes for good reason, undermining the legitimacy of science for plenty of good reasons sometimes, and we already talked about big pharma. Um, and oddly, he undermines the his own government in a way um, by appearing sort of rogue and not part of it while also running it. So it's always like the deep state, the FDA, the CDC, he's always trashing the thing that he runs <laughs> um, in a way to sort of appear separate from it and to undermine confidence in it. Um, it's fa- To be honest, it's fascinating if it wasn't so dangerous. So given that chasm, what do we do? Is there a, ever, is there a way to bridge this chasm to kind of repair these relationships that we have between this kind of atomized (laughs) culture, this kind of extremism that we see on both sides. Yeah. Well, you know, I've thought about this a bit. And the one institution that still holds authority in folks' minds is the institution of religion. Mm. And in many cases, a lot of these people are just single issue voters who are voting black and white pro-life. That's it. They don't know about politics. They aren't reading the New York Times. They're not getting involved. It's just simple and straightforward for them. So religion plays a very large part, so much so that I had a conversation with an old classmate of mine who is a Trump supporter in an effort to understand. And she flat out said to me, you know, I don't know anything about politics, so I can't debate them with you. But I will tell you that our church pastor said this week that the only political party that matters is Jesus. That's the one we should be following. And so I thought, well, okay, (laughs) maybe there could be something said about bringing back 
back traditional Christian values. But <laughs> right, uh, Jesus for president, no term limit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think it's interesting that that time of the of the week, that's mm-hmm. where their attention is. That's where their uh, you know their loyalties lie. In many ways, it's not everybody, but it's a lot of people. And there's a lot of hypocrisy with this. But at the same time, I wonder, you know, how much that institution is either contributing to or helping. I wonder if it's helping. I mean, that message sounded, you know, relatively nice in many ways. The idea was, listen, don't fight with your friends because this is the only party that matters. But I think there's just a lot of, there's a lot of ignorance and unlogic and misinformation happening. And if you can't trust the media, I mean, like that's how usually you get your information about presidents to vote for. This is a huge problem. And once Donald Trump is out of office, I think over time things will become more normalized, but I think it's going to take a real big effort. Yeah. It's interesting that you bring up religion because I I think about the utility of religion often. Um, And, you know, I don't think people necessarily rely on it because in the scripture, in Leviticus, it says we should stone apostates or something. I think it's something more logistically useful is that every Sunday, It actually brings people together in communion and reconnects them with their higher selves and with their community and with the people around them. And, you know, I feel like that's kind of what you are doing every time you reach out and try to have a conversation with with people that that from your hometown or that you may not agree with. But it is that sense of communion and coming together in, in an atmosphere where you are your highest moral self. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, I, I, I'm sort of a secular humanist, so I can write off, you know, religion from a textual basis quite flippantly, and, and I tend to, and then I catch myself when I think about it for its utility in this way. And, you know, I, I wonder if we can't use our churches um, and by extension, our yoga studios or any place of community gathering. Of course, that's hard in COVID right now, but as places to heal, to actually really have these hard conversations that, that you seem to be um, resolute you know, on, on having. So I, you know, I, um, and it, it's the abortion issue, which when you talk about the single issue voter, and, and I wonder how you feel about this, because I have been debating that, this with many of my liberal friends and, you know, for, for a man to talk about this is, it's almost like I'm galloping down the third rail, but, um, but, you know, I I wonder sometimes if the Democratic Party could not be more open to a broader set of conversations around abortion, recognizing that many people that hold a very strident pro-life opinion are doing it not from a place of denying women their rights, but doing it from a place of deeply held morality. And it's almost like we have to strip back the exterior, the policy, and almost reconnect with people on on a heart level. And, And then also just kind of from a practical point of view, if the Democratic Party were open to a, a plurality of of opinions around abortion, it very mel- we, uh, might, you know, be the dominant party for generations. So I, I don't want to put you on the spot about abortion necessarily. No, no. Um, but, I, you know, I, you know, and I say this, you know, as someone who supports a woman's right to choose. But but I'm also trying to kind of open my mind and, and look at it both from a perspective that recognizes the intention 
of a person's policy and also from sort of a, a politically pragmatic one. Yeah, I'm analyzing this in my mind in relation to what I've experienced personally in rural America. And I have to say, I don't know a single person from there who's ever had an abortion. And I'm also observing that it is very much the cultural norm to simply have kids. It's kind of what you do. There's not a lot uh, there's not a lot to do. So I think that kids bring a certain sense of meaning and purpose to their lives. So I'm looking for the deeper layer here beyond the religious argument. I'm looking for the deeper layer of how this really contributes to their identity and uh, why it matters. And there's also a certain thing flicking around in my brain here about going back to the sense of unfairness, where we talked about the girl who was mad about the idea of of raising the minimum rate wage to $15 an hour because it's somehow unfair to her. There is a victim mentality. So in this way, I almost wonder if there's a sense that, you know, I had to just suck it up and and do my duty as a person and a human being and a mother and this is my this is my lot in life. So by you having an abortion, you're cheating. There's almost this sense of like you're getting one over on me. You're not doing what's right. And I had to suffer and I am suffering, even though I'll never say it out loud. Mm. Yeah, no, 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 no. It's food for mm. thought. Food for thought. Mm. That is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But abortion All is right. a big issue. The two big ones are abortion and, and the right to bear arms. Those two for me are the most that would move the needle for voters in rural America were there to be some kind of compromise. Yeah. So where is there a glimmer of hope? Is there one? I think liberals and Democrats, for as hard as we're trying to have conversations and point things out, point things out that are glaringly dangerous and obvious about the current administration and what's happening here, and every single report is this other bombshell, I think that's only serving to further cement our own beliefs about why this is problematic. But I do think that in order for this to improve, we need to start having conversations not about Donald Trump, but about people as a whole. And and really what rural America means to our society. It it has to mean something. It's a very large chunk and we cannot simply neglect it. There have been articles written by certain scholars who have just flat out said, hey, man, if you live in a small town that's dying, it is your duty to get out of there because nothing's going back. Manufacturing ain't coming back and you just it's you have to leave. But where does that leave us as a nation? Uh, I think you're only as healthy as uh, as the whole. If you've got a cancer in your stomach, you know, you're not going to be healthy. So I think we need to consider more about people instead of just Donald Trump and what needs to happen to make people feel like they matter. All of us uh, need to have different conversations and not be so <sighs> quick to rule someone as, as right or wrong, as hard as it can be sometimes. Yeah, I agree with you. And, and it'll take a significant effort to have those conversations and to change that that dialogue um, yeah. and uh and i'm grateful that you're doing it i'm trying so. i think i've been blocked by many people but <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying That's okay. you know i've thought so often there's an organization called mainstreet.org and they are on a mission to go into formerly thriving towns that had these main streets and work with people in the local community to start their own businesses and become entrepreneurs and take ownership over their town and see if we can you know, revitalize some of these areas. And there's something to be said about that. I think this is very important, giving people back their sense of agency. It's what I focused on in my book. It is very much about, you know, about understanding that you can absolutely do anything you want. 
you, you can. The internet has empowered us in ways that no one realizes because all they're doing is sitting around still chatting on Facebook. But it's not just a tool to to communicate. It's a, really a tool to create and to better oneself. You don't have to be in a big city anymore. And I don't think there's enough conversations about that. I think more conversations about that need to be had. So that way you're not sitting in a small town in rural America, depending on other people to come and save you, depending on the church to tell you how to be a good person, depending on whether or not someone's going to give you a, a refund check. And if that's going to let you survive. There needs to be more discussion and more action around agency. And I think that will be a great, great uh, healing mechanism for folks when they feel like they are not victims anymore. And then they can vote according to, to things that aren't a matter of survival for them. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Ash Amber J. To follow Ash's work, please check out themiddlefingerproject.org. And as always, please feel free to email me at jeffk at onecommune.com with any comments or questions about the show. I read every email. That's all from the commune for this week. My name is Jeff Krasnow, and I am here for you.